श्रोतु शीलादयो गुण येजस्तुना मनो यत्र मनस्विना word for word translation mahatvam greatness ichhatam for those desiring tirtham the process shrotuhu of the hearer shiladaya high character gunah qualities yatra in which tejah prowess tad that ichunam for those who desire manah adoration yatra in which manasvinam for thoughtful men translation and purport by his divine grace ac bhaktivedanta swami shri prabhupad translation anyone who hears this narration of dhruva maharaj acquires exalted qualities like him for anyone who desires greatness prowess or influence here is the process by which to acquire them and for for thoughtful men who want adoration here is the proper means purport in the material world everyone is after profit respectability and reputation everyone wants the supreme exalted position and everyone wants to hear about the great qualities of exalted persons all ambitions which are desirable for great persons can be fulfilled simply by reading and understanding the narration of dhruva maharaj's activities so this is shrimad bhagavatam let's cite some prayers before we move ahead so om gyana timirandasya gyanan janishalakaya चक्षूरोन्मल तस्म श्रीगुरव नम ओम विष्णुपदा कृष्णपृष्ठा भूतले श्रीमते भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी नामिने नमस्ते सारस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवादी पाश्चात्यदेशिणे वाचाकूभ्य कृपा सिंधु पतिता पावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधार श्रीवास गौरभक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 रामा हरे रामा राम रामा हरे हरे hare krishna so here we stop this one so here we continue our discussion we continue our discussion on this verse a conclusion of the dhruva maharaj past time and here the narrator that is sutta shukadev goswami is telling the as the readers that this is what we will get if we can turn toward the lord and we can become devoted to him by hearing the lord's past time hearing in particular this past time this is what we can get at mahatvam ichhatam those who desire something great they can get that great thing also it's not that they can't get it they will get it and how will they get it they will get it by just hearing this past time now we may wonder this seems to be first of all quite a, a materialistic promise without much component of spirituality in it and along with that it also seems to be quite a bit of a, is it a over promise is it that everybody who hears this particular past time will actually become that way all that will actually become will develop the <clears throat> develop wealth and greatness mahatvam ichitam will they actually become great so the first part of the question that rises 
uh, I have we discussed yesterday why material promises are also sometimes given. The purpose of giving material promises is to help us recognize that for each one of us there has to be a gradual progression in one's growth. The growth doesn't happen automatically. And initially people need to be given what they want before they can be given what they need. And in that sense, this is talking about something which is quite significant. That the attitude that We all can even get material things by the worship of the Lord. That is something which is very important for a devotee to understand. Not necessarily in terms of a devotee seeking material things, but in terms of a devotee at least recognizing that there is, a, there is something much higher in life which can also be sought and attained in due course. So let's try to look at this in terms of uh, what this means for us as seekers. So the first question that might come, which, we, which I didn't discuss yesterday was, how do we actually understand these promises? Are they something which are, are they possibilities? Are they universal realities? Uh, are they something which may happen? Uh, but is it that you know, we all have heard the pastimes of, we have read the pastime of Dhruva many times. We may have heard it many times. So is it that all of us will develop this kind of greatness, Mahatto Michyatam, as is described? So these are all very important questions that need to be addressed carefully. So how might we go about addressing them? Let's consider that one by one. Somehow, I'm sorry, my PPT is not opening. Okay. Uh, can you see my PPT as such? No, I just see the white white block with your um, other windows open and stuff. Oh, so you're yeah. not seeing my, can you see the PPT now? No, not Sorry, sorry, I don't know. It's acting as if the PowerPoint program is not there on my laptop at all. That's strange. Okay, let me see. I'm opening in Google Slides now. Oh, just now it was there, just now it got disappeared. Mm -hmm. Now I see it. Okay. So let's see if I can present this. No, but presenting would make it, I won't be able to edit it. Okay, so understanding scriptural promises is the broad theme I'm going to discuss today. Let's go up. Okay, that's all I can have. I hope this is okay. So I think it should still be visible. So we, we look at it, this in two terms over here. So we could, if you look at it in terms of this, are the scriptural promises real? Or one is they're universally true at all times. That could be one attitude. The other attitude could be they are just poetic exaggerations. Mm. So now if they are universally true at all times, we may claim that and we say this is the faithful position. If, it's, if scripture promises, it is going to happen. But then it is quite often we who have to add caveats which are not given in scripture. Say for example, this will happen when we hear in proper consciousness when we hear with proper faith, when we hear in parampara. So then now these are caveats which are not exactly mentioned in the scripture. They, may be, they, may, they, they have a true element in it, no doubt. But they are not mentioned in the scripture. So if we claim that they are universally true, you know, experience doesn't seem to demonstrate that. But then if you go to the other extreme and they say they are just poetic exaggerations, that is not the way our tradition has approached it. And we know that... The Bhagavatam is spoken in a very serious frame of mind. Parikshit Maharaj is about to die and he's facing life's final exam very gallantly. So at that time, 
none of the participants neither shukdev goswami uh, or sutta goswami with, neither of them seem to be in a mood where they would be interested in poetic exaggeration of things they so how do we understand this so we can put it in this way that they are these promises they are expressions of the magnitude of the lord's compassion the magnitude that krishna can be this compassionate also now does that mean that in every situation he will be compassionate in exactly the same way well not necessarily we say why not so it's why not because we have to see that is as a there's a matter of reciprocation over here so ultimately we have, there is a reciprocity principle so if the devotee approaches the lord in a repentant mood then what happens is the lord reciprocates in a compassionate mood so that means if if our heart is if we approach the lord with a repentant heart and the lord reciprocates with a compassionate heart hmm? so if a person is really approaching with a repentant heart oh my dear lord i have committed many many mistakes i have done many misdeeds so i need your mercy that's a repentant heart so the repentant heart evokes the recip- the compassionate heart from the lord now however if we go there with a calculative head now this is what this particular book has promised and i have done it why is it not pro- producing the result so if we go to with a calculative head the lord can also reciprocate with a calculative head i'll explain what a calculative head means but this principle of reciprocity is actually bhagavad gita 4.11 that ye tamam prapadyante tam sathaiva bhajamme hum as all people as all people surrender unto me i reward them accordingly so this principle is being demonstrated over here let's see how or this principle is applicable over here more precisely if we consider how the reciprocity principle apply in this context how we approach and how the lord reciprocates so for example if we approach with a repentant heart that means my dear lord i am so fallen without your mercy i have no hope then what happens is the lord responds with a compassionate heart you know i will use my unlimited mercy to wash away to get rid of all your misdeeds so the attitude with which you approach evokes a reciprocal attitude from the lord side but if we approach with a calculative head no okay this is what the scripture promised i have done this much devotional service i have done this, this 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 and therefore i am entitled to this now the lord can very well reciprocate this is the calculative head he, if he starts calculating our misdeeds Now, of of course in one sense karma is a infallible calculator but here we are talking about bhakti and bhakti is, in one sense it's like mercy supersedes or mercy goes goes far beyond justice leave alone retribution but if we start becoming calculative then the lord can also become calculative so we done so many wrong doings we have done in so many lifetimes so so the whole mood in bhakti is an approach of shraddha is an approach of devotion and devotion itself does not mean calculation if you start becoming very calculative then that is not really very devotional now now nowadays many devotees on ekadashis the uh, ekadashis we read ekadashi mahat some devotees read ekadashi mahat and this story this ekadashi has so much potency and that ekadashi has so much potency now in one sense any way we are intensifying our devotion that is good but prabhupa did not talk so much about specific ekadashis and the stories beyond them behind them now we might become very calculative in our bhakti also oh in this month i can get much much more credits in kartik if i do bhakti i get much more credits therefore i'll do more bhakti in kartik okay it's yena kena prakara and somehow or other practice bhakti that is good at one level another level as devotees we want to think rather than thinking i'll get more mercy and think kartik is a month that is dear to krishna 
सो लेट मी प्लीज कृष्णा ऑन दिस डे इट लाइक जन्माष्टमी वाई डू वी डू स्पेशल ऑस्टेरिटी is it so that krishna hai krishna is in a more generous mood and krishna will give more mercy that's good that is also when anyway we get mercy it is good anyway we can connect with krishna is good but actually if we are really treating krishna as a person then this is the day when krishna appeared and not just he appeared in this world but he appeared for us for souls like us who are lost in this world so we we do special devotional activities simply to please krishna it's like we go to somebody's birthday party and we give them a special gift hoping that they will give us a special gift back in return well at least some connection is developed so you know the, the calculative mentality we often turn away from it with respect to material results and that's understandable as devotees we are not interested so much in material results but we sometimes bring the same calculative mentality with respect to spiritual results so the so now whether the results are material or spiritual uh, why material results are promised because the principle is yena kena prakare manah krishna nivesh somehow or other fix the mind on krishna however if one starts insisting on those material results expecting those material results then that can lead to problems let's see how it will lead, lead to problems you know so what could be a so how do we see so we could say analyzing scriptural promises if i put it this way here how do we analyze scriptural promises if these are extraordinary promises or if you do this you'll get this 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 so we expect and demand at the same happens for us say for example in this case that narayan was chanted the name of narayan was chanted just once by ajamil and what happened was he was he was delivered first time he was delivered from the yamadutas that itself is glorious so can we demand why do i need to chant throughout my life i'll just chant at the end of my life and i'll expect deliverance well it's not that simple it's not that simple that is never the mood of our acharyas that is not the mood of shukdev goswami when he narrates this past time and that is not the mood of shri prabhupada in his commentary the mood is so we expect and demand the same happens for us that is like the calculative head we are approaching with the calculative head but what what we need to do is approach with a repentant heart filled with faith in the lord so the idea is that if the lord can be so much, so merciful to occasional practitioners of bhakti how much will he will he be merciful if i if i practice bhakti diligently so somebody chants the names once if he chant regularly life long how much more we will be uh, we will be benefited we will be blessed rather even the word benefit is um, is a bit calculative mm. so it's of course we can use the word mm. but words have certain connotations in people's minds and we need to be aware of those connotations recently i was talking with a with a devotee who does a lot of contemporary outreach and he said that i have found even the word spiritual advancement hmm, that to many people in today's world sounds very self serving it's like you know i'm saying see, i am seeking financial advancement i am seeing corpo- seeking corporate advancement so i want to grow in my i want to get a bigger position i want to get a uh, financial advancement so he said he almost always prefers the word spiritual growth hmm? growth doesn't sound to be calculative growth at least growth doesn't come out to be doesn't have that mundane calculate or corporate connotation so sorry so if we now apart from the connotation of the words the, the emotion or the disposition of the heart is also important so if we are approaching and this is what i should also be getting then uh, we are missing out on the point that there is a personal relationship with the lord so let's take this point uh, you know when we talk about faith somebody may say no but if this is told in the scripture this is going to happen i don't want to hear any rationalization of yours this is going to happen and if you question this then you are a doubter well okay that could be one way of looking at it uh, but is that the only way of understanding faith if you consider 
faith and devotional disposition what does devotional disposition in the context of faith mean i believe that god is omnipotent god can do everything anything and everything yes krishna can for one who or to speak of the entire dhruva maharaj past time krishna can deliver somebody who just hears one one verse of the dhruva maharaj past time but how does my faith in god's omnipotence and benevolence translate if i expect and demand because you you said you will do this this is what the scripture says therefore it has to happen and why can you not do it so if we may pray to we may say to god like this you have the power to do everything then why are you not doing this thing for me so if we have this this attitude in this question now this is not a particularly devotional disposition and this will not be particularly pleasing to the lord also so why are you not doing this thing for me so the, so the omnipotence of the lord is not meant to uh, make him a servant of our desires even if our desires are devotional desires and what to speak of our desires which may not be devotional right now on the other hand the faith means we need to commit and await yes if this is what the lord can do then he now he knows what is best for me so the mood of a devotee would be you know my oh lord what is best for me and i will keep striving for your mercy no matter how long it takes so there is awaiting on one side and there is committing it's not just committing not just awaiting it's both so you have a plan for my advancement for my growth the word advancement is quite implicit in our vocabulary so what happens is that if we consider from that perspective we we are not denying the reality of those promises the scriptural promises at all but we are saying that to to expect that reality to be translated into our lives and to to say that that expectation is actually the strength of our faith well that may be a misunderstanding of what faith is so why why is why is that exactly because ultimately we are we are talking about a relationship with the lord and the relationship with the lord means it's a personal relationship it's a personal reciprocation the lord is not like a machine where you know if we put in say like a there is a soda vending machine or there is some <clears throat> some machine which gives some drinking water or something okay you put this much money and you'll get this much water or this much this this kind of food item or this kind of stuff you'll get from that the lord is not like that his reciprocity is personal it's not mechanical and that brings us to the next point over here so as soon as we talk about personality we cannot have complete predictability now this doesn't mean now what does it mean if if we start expecting mathematical predictability that means that say for example if i take this phone and i drop this now i won't drop it but if i were to drop it it will fall down and if somebody knows enough physics they can say from here if my hand is below or if the floor is below after how much time it will fall that can be predicted so in some ways mathematical predictability works enormously precisely uh, in many domains of material nature but it is domains of material nature where conscious beings are not involved but in the domain of conscious beings <clears throat> but this doesn't work actually so so there are some fields of scientific uh, hard sciences are of course math but when you come to economics economic models have not really been very successful because people's behaviors can't be so so thoroughly predicted and nowadays with the pandemic Uh, is this going on and on for more than a year of course some parts are recovering the thing is that some people say follow the science but the problem is that this is not just a this is not just a microbe which for uh, which from our perspective practically has no consciousness and simply going wherever it can reproduce and uh, reproduce and uh, grow but it is also conscious beings so which model of say epidemiology how epidemics spread how they can be controlled 
which model will work which model will not work so we could say biology is a hard science related in space physics is the hardest of sciences biology is a relatively considered to be hard science but still it is logo study of life but if you go to uh, economics if you go to epidemiology so these involve not just microorganisms which behave in relatively predictable ways but it also involve their carriers of the microorganisms who don't behave in predictable ways so some parts of the world there have been complete lockdowns and then still the pandemic has spread and that is blamed on people who who didn't follow the lockdowns and there are other parts of the world where relatively few where lockdowns were never imposed or not not that strictly and in some parts over there the pandemic has spread severely in some parts it has not spread so some places they say people were responsible and that's why it didn't happen some people say the weather was uh, weather was inclement whatever so it's it's a, it's not so easy to predict so if it is difficult to predict the behavior of human beings itself then what to speak of predicting the behavior of the supreme being so if we expect mathematical predictability in terms of the fulfillment of of scriptural promises then we are in one sense almost reducing the supreme lord to a mechanical principle or a mechanical function almost on the other hand if we go to the other extreme then it then doesn't mean it's not predictable at all does that mean there is do we fear total unreliability that means i may practice bhakti throughout my life and still i will get nothing but trouble in my life because the lord is completely independent and that is uh, that seems to be quite objectionable to us that doesn't make sense to us and that is not what uh, the scriptures also teaches so so the in between balance understanding would be see the unpredictability of his reciprocity as exciting not disorienting that means it's a person and how the person acts that is unpredictable but that unpredictability doesn't make it mean that he it's going to be just necessarily chaotic it is actually going to be uh, it's it's the excitement of devotion it's when prabhupad went to america at that time it was not that he had a clear understanding of what would happen where he would go and so how it would happen uh actually speaking the thing is that prabhupad himself says that uh acche kichu karje tabe ei anumane anumane prabhupad says that this is my inference this is my almost anuman can mean guess this is my guess that this is what will happen mm that you must have some plan for me o lord it is not that prabhupad had a complete a clear picture of this is how krishna is going to reciprocate with me prabhupad had faith and krishna himself came to him in a special vision and that also reinforced prabhupad's conviction you know jaladuta but still it was not that everything was clearly known to prabhupad and that's how everything worked out no it was not at all like that so in fact if we move forward uh, if you look in principle at the way things work that the lord reciprocates with the devotees but even in the bhagavatam there are different past times where the where the success of devotion is demonstrated in different ways to different degrees now if we consider here even this particular past time which we are discussing this is the conclusion of the dhruva maharaj past time and this is like the thrilling the numa it is the climax of the past time and in this finale for the riveting story it is the ultimate success is shown as if in a dramatic multicolor display that means what everybody sees that this airplane comes from above and the vishnu does come out and they honor dhruva and then dhruva ascends on to that airplane and then dhruva actually steps it said death comes towards him and he steps on the foot of death and he climbs up now all these are very dramatic and vivid demonstrations of spiritual success how 
he was he was totally successful so in the dhruva past time actually at one level bhakti is demo bhakti is shown to provide material success and spiritual success by the practice of bhakti he becomes a powerful king and by the practice of bhakti he also in a visible way attains the ultimate success but if you consider this kind of result this kind of thr- this kind of materially visible success is its rarity even in the bhagavatam so if you consider the bhagavatam is to a large extent a book about death about departure from the world so when you talk about the de- death so we have dhru maharaj past time here the mode of de- so the description of that and the the character whose death is described so so if you consider uh, <clears throat> the character who departs from the world and what happens over here is the mode of departure if you consider for dhruva vaikuntha airplane comes and takes him to the spiritual world but if you consider the pandavas their departure is not that dramatic they come to know that krishna has departed from the world they are devastated by that especially arjuna's devastation is described in the first canto 15 chapter and after that what happens is the pandavas depart that they go to the forest and the specifics of the details the specifics and the details are uh, can vary the way they are described in the mahabharata and the bhagavatam are slightly different but the point is that uh, the way the mahabharata describes it, they go northward they meditate and they depart from the world so now if you consider prithu maharaj prithu maharaj he again he renounced he has a successful life he is able to discipline the earth he is able to perform 99 sacrifices but at the end of it he enters into meditation and he departs from the world so again in his, in the neither in the case of the pandavas nor in the case of prithu nor in the case of prithu there is a there is any visible demonstration of a person going back to godhead or of a plane coming to take them to go back to godhead now if you consider i am only taking out some deaths in the bhagavatam not all of them but if you were puranjan a puranjan of course is the allegory and puranjan in the next life becomes vaidehi and vaidehi her husband dies and she is lamenting and that is the time the super soul appears before her and the super soul solaces her and then the, exactly it is not described that a vaikuntha airplane comes or she uh, or he or she the puranjan basically he he joins hands with the super soul and goes back but it's just that the super soul the awareness of the super soul arises and that implies that eventually he will go toward perfection the specifics can vary uh, in terms of uh, the commentary of the acharyas but the point is that through the way there is visible demonstration of the attainment of perfection in dhru maharaj that is rare even in the bhagavatam if you consider ajamil there is some some level of miraculousness so there is he sees the vishnu dutas once when he is about to die and then after that he performs great austerities and again he sees vishnu dutas coming but again the, in that case it's only vishnu dutas described there is not much explicit description that they come with a plane and they take him in the plane is not described there like that now if you consider the vitrasur now overall each now ajamil is not a particularly uh, particularly exalted devotee initially but we see that there is some miracle happens for him and even dhruva so if we say dhruva starts from a materialistic motive ajamil gets diverted into not just materialism but gross sinful materialism for both of them there is some level of visible miracle happening so the level of visible miracles happening that doesn't seem to correlate in any way with the merit of the overall life trajectory of the person so vritrasur is a demon and he's fighting as a demon and suddenly towards the last moment his devotion from his previous life as chitraketu manifests but is his death all that is described is that he actually he swall- swallows uh, indra and then indra has, breaks through his belly and then uh, uh, actually he cuts his body body you can say his body is cut by indra which are part of the body we want to talk about over here so he bursts through the belly and then 
but for that whole time he, indra has to do a lot of work but it's described that rutrasura has departed the spiritual world now nobody exactly sees rutrasura depart from this spiritual world if we consider yadus the yadus they are intimate associates of krishna and their departure seems to be quite tragic they fight among each other it's tragic and horrific and they fight among each other till death this is quite brutal but it's this guy that even they attain perfection if you consider parikshit maharaj he is the hero of the bhagavatam in one sense the character for whom the bhagavatam is spoken krishna is of course the ultimate hero but at a visible level there's nothing dramatic it's dramatic that he renounced the world it's tragic that he is put in a situation where he has to die in 7 days but he sits and hears and at the end of it from a visible perspective all that happens is tak this takshak comes and bites him and actually takshak now there are different description takshak comes it says as a, he comes as if he's a brahmana and suddenly he reveals himself to be the snake bird and he bites him and then his body bursts into flames so from a worldly perspective it can seem to be a horrendous death that there are various ways of uh, dying uh sick beheading or shooting or putting a bullet it's painful but it's quick burning is ghastly because we can sense our body being burned all around so we could say parikshit's death parikshit maharaj's death is quite quite horrific in that sense so but with a spiritual vision we understand that all of them although the mode in which they died was uh, they departed from the world they disappeared from the world was radically different but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh one of them was more more meritorious and other was less meritorious now of course i have i haven't mentioned over here bishma because bishma is is in many ways it's considered ideal departure because it's he was it right in the presence of krishna in the and he after giving instruction to the pandavas he departed so that's that's the ideal death but if we consider uh, in terms of visible demonstrations we could see as bishma had krishna in front of him that's a solace but something miraculous happening at the time of death that's not that common even in the bhagavatam so in one sense to appreciate the bhagavatam we also need to develop shastra chakshu without that we cannot appreciate what the scripture is telling us so the promises so in one sense to this to so we need scriptural wisdom to understand how scriptural promises are going to be fulfilled otherwise what will happen is with mundane vision we will just not be able to appreciate scriptural promises so we could say that uh, shastra chakshu as we see the eyes of scripture chakshu is eye shastra chakshu so we need scriptural wisdom to understand how scriptural from how scriptural promises are to be seen so that is the point overall that so without that we can't just radically insist that this is how it is or radically is a dismissal this is not this is all just exaggeration there has to be a balanced holistic understanding and that's why if you see prabhupad's purports on the scriptural promises are never very elaborate in many past times prabhupada just gives one or two sentence purports uh, and he just moves on so on the other hand where we have to do some practice prabhupada is quite clear how we need to restrain ourselves from sensual pleasures how we need to commit ourselves to the practice of bhakti so in terms of what we need to do prabhupada is quite emphatic how we need to clarify our conceptions how we need to purify our hearts how we need to increase our uh, rectify our actions all those prabhupada is very very emphatic so overall as devotees we need to focus more on what we can do what we should be doing so the focus of scripture is on how we should be acting not on how how what god will do and how god will do it that is there and that's a dramatic narrative but that's not the focus of scripture broadly speaking so we could put it as shifting the focus so there is this huge and common philosophical question 
that why do bad things happen to good people now this is a philosophical question and it's an important philosophical question and we can go into the into the philosophy of karma to explain it but the bhagavatam really does, never does really exhaustively analyze the principle of karma the bhagavatam actually it asks it reframes the question and that re, the whole bhagavatam is about when bad things happen to good people what do good people do that in the bhagavatam is time and time again a demonstration of this so if we apply this principle not just to the problem of evil but to the to the to scriptural promises themselves so if we shifting the focus to the this this is for the problem of evil the bhagavatam shift that focus and the same shift of focus we can also apply to say scriptural promises or the lord's reciprocation in large so if we focus on when will krishna do his part mm-hmm. if instead of focusing on that if we reframe the question what is the reframing the question how well am i doing my part if you focus on this question that is far far more productive and if you see prabhupad's purports are more in terms of this clarify our conceptions what is doing our part means clarify our conceptions we need to understand the nature of reality properly we need to need to understand the nature of god then we can have purify our intentions and rectify our actions so clarify purify rectify so this is in one sense the essence of devotion it is there is the head there is the heart and then we can say there are the hands so all three are important these are broadly three parts of our being so we clarify our conceptions we purify our intentions and then the hands represent actions we, we rectify our actions so if we do this if we do our part the lord will reciprocate now how he will reciprocate when he will reciprocate that is up to him and in that sense faith means uh, i'll conclude this point that faith doesn't just mean certainty of conviction faith also means openness as yes, krishna will protect me a faith the devotee has but how krishna will do it when krishna will do it in his on his terms so that is that is also faith so faith has both these aspects to it not just the uh, not just the part of uh, yes this is going to happen but so expanding our conception of faith conclude this point here we can have a few questions or comments that we could say faith in one side is faith is certainty of conviction yes krishna will protect me but it's also that's one aspect of faith but the other aspect is also openness openness you could say openness to possibility that this how krishna is going to work i don't know so prabhupad if you see in the markine bhagavad dharma he exhibits both of this he says that tomara ichcha hai sab hoye maya vash tomara ichcha hai nash maya ar parash that it is by it is under, you, you are the supreme controller o lord it is by your it is under your jurisdiction that people have gone into maya it is by your jurisdiction that people will come out of maya but he says i want to know how you want to make me dance my lord so i don't know right now so please make me dance the way you want make me dance like a puppet so kashthera putali jata na chao se mate so these two dimensions of faith are actually seen in prabhupada's markine bhagavad dharma so as devotees when we see these promises in scripture we need to we need to see them as manifestations of the lord's heart that this is the extent to which the lord's mercy can go but that doesn't mean we demand it has to go to that extent in that form that exact form in our lives we focus on connecting with the lord that means we focus not on the, this the, you have made this promise and i'm going to hold you to your promise rather the fact that you you make promises like this uh, that means you are so compassionate you are so merciful i want to develop a personal relationship with you 
and whatever that relationship entails i am ready for it so that is the mood of a devotee so we focus more on the person and connecting with the person rather than on the promise and expectation of the fulfillment of the promise then we will all deepen our devotion and ultimately our heart's deepest aspirations will be fulfilled in our eternal ecstatic union of love the bond of love with the supremely loving and supremely lovable lord of our heart krishna so i'll summarize what i spoke today broadly speaking today we discuss the theme of how do we see scriptural promises in terms of uh they some they may seem unrealistic to us how do we see their authenticity so the point is that at, we talk about two things first is that broadly two things that we need to it's a matter of reciprocity that that uh, it's reciprocity means if we approach with our repentant heart then the lord's compassionate heart will be manifested if we approach the calculative head the lord's calculative head will also be manifested so rather than reducing the lord to a machine which functions as promised we see that the promises are expression of a compassionate heart and we focus on connecting with that with that heart of the person and that is the most auspicious way to function that is the more that is a sustainable way to function and we discuss that elaborately how we are approaching the lord and second part i discussed is that at the material level at the material visible level how the lord's promises may how the lord may act in our lives that can be enormously variable from person to person so and that doesn't necessarily have to reflect the merit of the devotion of a particular character as druva's past time demonstrates success both at the material and the spiritual levels but that's not necessarily the way it is for all characters in the bhagavatam that can vary for different characters and we discussed how from um, <clears throat> right from ajamil to prutu to all of them how it is um, so that's how um we need to function and if we focus on connecting with the lord then faith means not just certainty of con- conviction but also openness to possibility and that's how we can move ahead in our lives in a way that is steady in our bhakti thank you very much hare krishna so any reflections or questions hi krishna sir Obviously. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you think it's um, appropriate to extend this to uh, different uh you could say promises or uh, explanations given by Shiva Prabhupada, uh some devotees have a uh, a question or lack of faith like when they see, oh, you know, if you dedicate your life Prabhupada saying, you know, to the Sankirtan movement then um and you can go back to godhead in this one lifetime so then there's uh devotees that they've seen have uh, dedicated their lives but then maybe one committed suicide or one had a, a left his body in a car accident after you know dedicating the whole life and one you know left their body completely alone or on and on and on so um just questioning you know like you're saying somebody might not have seen dhritarashtra leave or and there therefore the faith is a little bit wobbly so i was wondering if you have any reflections on that mhm that's an important question see when somebody uh because they may feel that Uh, sometimes devotees who even dedicate their lives they sometimes die in unfortunate accidents or something like that so faith becomes wobbly so one of my understandings about this is that that at there is there is uh, there is both a dynamic and an incremental aspect to faith 
That means as we practice bhakti, our faith naturally increases. So we could say if it's a graph, it's increasing. That's incremental aspect. But it's also a dynamic aspect. Dynamic aspect means what? That what, uh, what is the basis of our faith? That may change over time. Uh, I do podcasts with many, many senior devotees with whom we have discussions. So Shana Krishi Prabhu uh, was recently there on the podcast. He's the, the, he's the director of Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. So he says that if you really want to know devotees, we can ask them two questions. I said, the, uh, that when he told me the two questions, I said, the first question is very common. And the second question is extremely rare. But the first question is, oh, what brought you to Krishna consciousness? We all ask each other this question and we, it's one of the relishable, adventurous parts of Krishna consciousness to understand how Krishna draw, drew us all from wherever we were in our lives. But the second, second question is, what keeps you in Krishna consciousness? Now, <laughs> this question can almost seem sacrilegious for many people. What do you mean, what keeps? But actually, and to answer it candidly also requires a certain level of bonding between a certain level of faith, certain level of bonding, certain level of intimacy. Because there could be many reasons, not could be, each of us, if we want to right now, probably we can think of several reasons why, you know, we may, at least a part of us, maybe our mind, maybe I, I don't want to be here. So in spite of that, we are here. So now what keeps us in Krishna consciousness? So currently I, I, I journal quite regularly. So currently I'm journaling these two things. And what I find is that the reasons that brought me to Krishna consciousness and the reasons that uh, keep me in Krishna consciousness, they are definitely not identical circles. They are, we could say, overlapping circles. They're like Venn diagrams, but there are significantly different things. So many of the things which brought me to Krishna consciousness, those, those were the basis of my faith initially. Now, hey, maybe that is, that, is not the, that is not the basis of my faith. In fact, uh, I may feel that, you know, that if I think about that, that doesn't really convince me. That doesn't really attract me. And there are many aspects which I had no idea about earlier. Now, those have become quite central to my faith. So, and I've seen this journey with, with those who have candidly discussed this. So these two are significant. Now, there, there is difference. How significant the difference is that may vary from person to person. But the point is that for each one of us, we have to... Uh, we have to, we could say, re-examining and revising and refining the foundations of our faith. So if my faith was because of X, Y, Z, say for example, if my faith was big, that devotees are so nice, oh, I had so many bad relationships in the world and people are selfish and exploitative and this and that, and devotees were so kind and so loving and so, so friendly. If that is the basis of my faith, then if I meet devotees who are judgmental, if I de meet devotees who are demanding, if I meet devotees who may even be abusive or exploitative, then what's going to happen to my faith? It will shake completely. It can be shattered also. So, now, now does that mean that all devotees are like that? No. Ideally speaking, no devotee should be like that. But we are all fallible human beings. We, come, we live in a conditioned world and we come from our conditioned pasts. So, so if that were the foundation of my faith, then if or that alone were the foundation of my faith, then I would, I could run into serious problems. So for all of us, what is the foundation of our faith? We need to, we need to introspect that. And then at one level, we can say, we all may have a particular core foundation. So for example, for me, it was the philosophical aspect that attracted me to Krishna consciousness. And philosophy is definitely central to my understanding and practice of bhakti right now also. But it has grown a little bit. It's not just philosophy practice in a vacuum. It is philosophy, so you can say, practiced, relished and shared with other philosophically minded devotees. So it is not just the philosophy, but it is the reciprocation based on the, centered on the philosophy that is, that is what strengthens me. That is what inspires me. That's what nourishes me. So for all of us, 
on one side is whatever is the initial foundation of our faith we may try to build that and that's also good but sometimes we may need to you could say branch our faith in different directions so it's not just in the capacity of the philosophy to answer intellectual questions perfectly or satisfactorily at least but it's also that people who are i can see who are far more intelligent than what i am and they have grappled with these questions at a far deeper level than what i have and despite still grappling with these questions they are more committed than me to the practice of bhakti so that means there is something trans intellectual which keeps them going and maybe that is what should also be the focus of my bhakti or at least a significant part of my bhakti if not the focus so unless we uh, are these three things you know reexamining revising and refining the foundations of our faith we will we will our our spiritual journey will become far more far rockier than what it needs to be it will be rocky anyway that is the the fact of it is just the result of being in a material world which is a very rocky place but if we are not alert then it will be far rockier than what it needs to be does it answer the question yes thanks so much vivu especially the um association with the devotees that will um uh nourish that faith so that's the the real core there thank you so much vivu hi krishna thank you happy to give service if you want to make some comments i am um, you might also have some answers about this question please feel free to share um i'm just seeing that um even uh like you're saying uh, st- studying prabhupad's books in association of devotees is um helping us to grapple with some things maybe we're not certain of like oh why did you know these devotees leave their bodies like that or what or whatever it might be and um so as you were saying uh, we may start with a philosophy <clears throat> i'm interested in philosophy and then we grow to i'm interested to share with the devotees this philosophy and um you know that's really the sankirtan being together you know sharing and reading together and discussing you know together and this seems to be what uh shila prapad wants us to do more so thank you so much prabhu thank you very much happy to be of service you know I, i just forgot to mention about that particular question i don't want to go into elaborate answer but if say our conception of the perfection of devotion was is that a devotee departs like bhishma dev and then if we find that a devotee departs in accident then we will be shocked but the same bhagavatam also depicts how abhimanyu was killed brutally on the battlefield all alone how hanum how how jatayu was killed by ravan these are also part of our scriptures so so if we that's why what you said if you study prabhupad's books properly and not just impose our own conceptions of perfection on de- of devotional perfection but open ourselves to what scripture is actually talking about devotional perfection then yes within within scripture within prabhupad's purports we will find uh, resources for nourishing ourselves even if our initial conceptions of uh, or conceptions of devotional perfection or even devotional expectation are challenged or even shattered by life still we will find the resources to move ahead in our devotional journey okay. so thank you very much um, happy to be of service uh, any other comments or shall we stop here if you have time prabhu some others may have a question or reflection how how is your time prabhu Yeah, maybe five minutes, five ten minutes more we can take. Nine o'clock. I have another engagement. Yes. If you want, you can just step. You you are free to make. A, please share something if you like. 
Oh, just just to really appreciate. I, I like this analogy you gave. I think you said just like a, a soda machine. Hmm. We, we <laughs> put <laughs> we put we put money in it, and I thought I was actually just thinking of, of in Archana how Krishna, you know, Prabhupada says better than denying God or rejecting God, better to ask God, even if it's an order supplier mentality. That's better than not accepting the supreme. So. But higher than that in bhakti is uh, more of a, as you said, Krishna is a person. There is, uh, go for, you know, move forward to more of a personal relationship. So I was thinking how, how even like the deity, or, or as you said, you know, the soda machine, like I'll give this, and then I'll get this. It, it's, it's a very mechanical kind of external relationship, which is at least some start. Uh, but then in bhakti, or as we develop in bhakti, especially going towards pure bhakti, it's just, I, I was just thinking of the imagery, how instead of just a machine giving you a, a soda, um, you're giving to a person without expecting, you know, it's uh, and then when that person reciprocates, not a machine, uh, it's a very personal embrace. It's a very comforting reciprocation. It's a, um, a personal recognition and, how nourishing that is on the path of bhakti versus just, okay, I got this soda from a machine or I got this reciprocation from Krishna, but in a very mechanical way. Um, but whereas from that example you gave, if we put in our service uh, with a very personal, devotional, heartfelt mood, when that reciprocation comes back, it's, it's, it's almost like, wow, it's magical. And uh, so I just thought just how, what a contrast, just the mechanical order supplier, put your coin in and get a soda versus serving, mm -hmm. or even in this example, serving someone, a person, and then that person gives you like a fresh squeezed juice or something. And like, wow, <laughs> you know, that, that didn't just come from a machine. So yeah, just, yeah. just the unique, just the unique aspect of bhakti and its personal touch. I just really appreciated how you highlighted that. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be of service, Mr. Bro. Nice contrast between the machine and the person. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Vanda Mataji, you would like to say something? We'll stop after that. Um, that's perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vantra Shri Bhagavatam Ki Jai. The Prabhupada Ki Jai. Gaur Bhaktavrinda Ki Jai. Jai Gaur Premanande.